here at Grace. We exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ for a gospel-centered life that impacts our homes and communities. This morning is one of those mornings where if I was an unsaved person, I would uh, do something that was very nostalgic. I would turn on or get the, the grill ready. Mm -hmm. I, I would get the grill ready and uh, I would also have, uh, as I was brought up, I would have me, uh, not that I would do it now, but I would have me a pack of Budweiser's. Yes. Even though I don't like it. You know, my palate has been more sophisticated since then. <laughs> and in the background, I would have um, my favorite type of music, which is old school music. It is blues music. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but have you ever just listened to blues music? Have you listened to the words of blues music? I'm reminded of blues music because what happened in my youth, that was what we did when times were tough. Now this morning, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna need you to help me uh, preach this message this morning. Because it's, for me, it's, it's a tough one. I'm gonna need some amens. I'm gonna need some ouches. I'm gonna need some preach, pastor, preach. <laughs> and then when you get a little deep, you wanna say, well, what you say? <laughs> So this morning, we're going to have a little fun. The title of this message this morning is that when we're surrounded by adversaries, it's not as bad as it seems. We live in a life where we are surrounded by chaos. And as we are surrounded by chaos, chaos just seems like it takes over us. And we see what happens is that when we're surrounded by chaos, either we act one or two ways. We run toward it or we run away from it. Mm -hmm. This psalm, David, is actually one of the first psalms that he penned himself. In this book, uh, we would say Psalms 1 through Psalms 141, we see David himself as identified as the author of Psalms 3. We see that this is the first book, and when we see the word psalm, it could mean musical instrument or song. This psalm that David wrote was a psalm of lament. And if you don't know what lament is, it's an expression of grief or sorrow. It's an expression of mourning. It's an expression often demonstrated by regret. This is an expression that David is singing at a, a point in his life. One thing I love about the Psalms itself is that it's written in the background of real people in real lives. Have you ever been in that moment in your life where you're just feeling the blues? Amen. And you're just ready to say, hey, enough's enough. I'm done. I'm out of here. You do what you do. I'm going to do what I do. And we're going to just go. Have you been there? Have, have, have you been to that place where you're saying, okay, I am, okay, well, whatever, okay, good, I'm good, I, I'm, I'm tapped out. Come on. Come on. Preach, Pastor, preach. This is the first of, of several prayers that shows up in the book of Psalms. Now, to give you a little historical background about this psalm itself, this psalm takes place in life experiences in, um, what is that, 2 Samuel chapter 13 through 18. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 13 verse 18, we see this catastrophic event that disrupts the family. But what we understand also is that David himself had already known that something was going to happen. He just didn't know when because of the sin that he had already committed. Amen. Nathan the prophet came to him and told him, this is what's going to happen to you because of your sin. 
give you some background of what actually went down, David himself took Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. That's interesting about her name. Her name is Bathsheba. And he saw her taking a bath. <laughs> and he took her and he had her. Then he had, after he had her and found that she was with child, he took and had her husband murdered. That's an old saying. What goes around comes around, right? In Samuel chapters 13, 2 Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 13 through 18, we see Amnon, mm -hmm. David's, David's son. He raped his half-sister Tamar. Mm -hmm. That's some internal conflict right there. Mm -hmm. And then it starts. Absalom, his son, Kill his brother Amnon to honor for the honor of his sister Tamar. Mm -hmm. Then Absalom <laughs> turned and started a revolt against his dad. Mm -hmm. He took the people, the allegiance of the people, he took his daddy's concubines, and then to put salt on the wound, he put a hit out on his own day. Uh. Now, if somebody don't know the blues, we know David knows the blues, right? <laughs> Thank God we had to live that life, right? Amen. David lost his throne, he lost his country, he lost his city, and the people were against him. Not all the people, but, you know, when you're in that blues mindset, it just seems like everybody's against you, right? Jesus. David himself was a man after God's own heart. That's why I tell you, be careful when you think you're a David. You're not. <laughs> in this song, we see this word, Selah. Now, what some of the commentators and some of the theologians say about this word Selah is the first of seeing this word here. What it says here is that it is a pause or musical note. So Psalm itself was a new musical note or what have you. Then you would have Selah right behind it. And Selah was one or two things. And theologians are divided, but the majority of them have come to one conclusion that it is to pause and think about what was said. So we'll see this in verse 2, verse 4, and verse 8. Selah. Some people believe that uh, when you hear the word Selah, it was more along the lines of increase the sound of the music and, or bring the music louder. And, and I said before, some people believe that it was a pause. I, I would share with you just my own personal belief. I'm no theologian. But my own personal belief is that it is a pause to reflect back on what was said before. David was a hurt man. Can you imagine living that type of life? He was hurting during the time that he wrote Psalms 3. And what we see, things will get better when things seem as bad as though they are. In other words, your worser ain't worse yet. Uh, all right, all right. In verse 1 and 2, it reads, A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying, My soul, there is no salvation in God. Say, love. David, at this point in his life, was specific about the foes that troubled him. One of the things I want you to know about problems is that problems usually always comes in three. David repeats himself three times in these first two verses. Many, many, many. Don't you realize when you have one problem, it seems like something else pops up? 
I paid this bill off. Oh, Lord, another one just going to pop up. I don't got this situation straight in my life. Oh, Lord, another one just going to pop up. I don't deal with this business part. Oh, Lord, now this one's coming from the side. It's that sometimes in our lives we just deal with many, many, many problems. But David teaches us one thing. Come on, preach, Pastor, preach. He teaches us one thing. Y'all ready? Bring your complaints to the Lord. All right? This is what David teaches us. He, he teaches us to, to bring our complaints to the Lord. When I'm getting ready to complain about something, I ain't complaining to none of you. I'm complaining to the Lord. Lord, I'm sick and tired. I've been sick and tired. I'm done with this. I'm ready to go. Have you been there? But David prays this way. And before we jump into this, let me give you the big idea, because I'm going to jump ahead. I'm ready to, ready to, ready to roll this morning. <laughs> the big idea is this. When we find ourselves surrounded by people, when we find ourselves surrounded by adversity, in trouble, even from our own family members, our peace and security will be found praying to God and trust in God and waiting for Him for His deliverance. Yes, yes. Thank you, God. David teaches us in this one section of the text it's okay to complain, but you got to know who you're complaining to. Ah. You hear me this morning? It's okay to complain about what's going on in the world, what's going on in your life, what's going on in every other person's life, but you got to know the right person to complain to. David says himself, many are my foes. Now, from a practical context, David's talking about people and issues. How would we make that to our own life? What are your foes in your own life right now? What foes did you have that you need to take before the Lord and just say, Lord, this is what's going on in my life right now. I just need somebody to talk to. Have you ever been to that place where you just need somebody to talk to, but ain't nobody there? Amen. That's why you need to talk to God. Amen. David says, I have many adversaries. I have many rising up. I have many people saying, Absalom had turned the people against him. Verse 2, he says, many are saying of my soul. In other words, people already knew David's business. They knew what went on in David's life. They knew that David had already had an inappropriate relationship with Bathsheba. And because he had that inappropriate relationship, an uh, illegitimate child was born, but that child had died. And then what happened was after that, they got married and tried to get everything all together. But the people knew David's business. And because they knew David's business, what they wanted to do and what they were saying is that God ain't for him no more. And have you lived a life where it seems like trouble just hits you left and right and right and left, and it just seems like God ain't for you no more? That's Ebonics. I should say no more. <laughs> David specifically knew that God was his salvation. But the people were saying, there is no salvation for him. Now, in this context, salvation has nothing to do with eternal security. Salvation in this context is that God himself, or the psalmist would say it in this particular way, that it would be a physical and emotional a deliverance from something that bothered you. Now, David needed that type of physical and emotional because think about this. you got people who are trying to kill you, people that are talking about you, people that don't want you on your throne. So emotionally, it has taken a toll on him. And then physically, he's probably sick from it because people want to kill him. Mm. The people are saying because all this stuff is going on in David's life, that there can't be any salvation. God can't save him. 
Yeah, he may be God's man now, but he can't be God's man because all the stuff that is going on. Have, have you lived a life long enough and you had enough stuff that you went through and you feel like God can't be for me? David himself knew this. And then at the end of this, this, this first song, he says, what? Say I. In other words, the music stops. I want you to think about and meditate on what I just said. In, in our lives, sometimes there's enigmatic pauses that takes place where we've gone through the song ups and down and we follow the cello and, and, and all those different things, the guitar and, 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 and the horns, and, and we were on this high, but then we come down really, really low, and then the music just stops. It causes us to meditate on the things of life. And sometimes the things of life are very difficult to meditate on. In David's context, we see the evidence or the reaction of his sin. See, what we must realize here, if we repent, God will forgive our sins, but he may not remove the consequences of it. <laughs> that, that is a tough one. It's because God will remove our sins. He, 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 he removed the sins as far as east is from the west. But what happens is that we still may have to deal with the consequences of it. Ah. I'm reminded of one of my favorite preachers. He gave this example, so I'm going to copy it and make it mine this morning. <laughs> uh, a little boy was acting up, and he would not listen to his parents. And to dramatically show the little boy of his rebellion um, what, and what he was doing to his parents, uh, what his father did, he would take a nail and he would drive it in the garage door. For every action that the little boy did, he would take a nail and drive it in the door. Until the door became full of nails. So the little boy tearfully repented and said, Dad, I did all this as yes, you had. And he poured out his heart and said, Dad, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, Dad, forgive me. I I've done all these things. Please forgive me, Dad. So the dad started pulling out the nails by one, one by one to show his forgiveness to his son. Now, as all the nails were removed, only his son returned again. And he started tear, tearing up and crying again, even more. And when the dad asked him, he says, what's the matter, son? What's going on? Why are you crying? The nails are removed. The son told the daddy, daddy, the nails are gone, but the holes are still there. And see, that is something like our own, sometimes like our own life, sin so it is with sin in our own lives is that God removed the guilt of sin, but the evidence or the consequences of sin still say the same. David knew this was going on in his life. But what he did know was who to complain to. See, what we must realize here is when things get bad in our lives, we need to bring our complaints to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, to share with you before, this word Selah is for us now to take a pause to reflect on what was said before. Perhaps in our own lives, we are, we are struck by many physical problems, or we are struck by family problems, we are struck by marital problems, we are struck by financial problems, we are struck by relationship problems, we are struck by uh, just problems in general. But what we must always do is turn to the Lord. See, what we must realize is that God delights in coming 
to rescue his people when they cry out to him. Do you believe that this morning? We live in a terrible time. Do you believe that God delights when you rely upon him? Because sometimes we get ready to make rash decisions. Now I'm preaching to myself. We get ready to make rash decisions. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm good. You good, I'm good, I'm good. You good, I'm good. Okay, you good, okay, good. So, good. <laughs> but we have to take our decisions to the Lord. In verse 3 and 4, he says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy heel, saying, Lord. But you, O oh Lord, what is David doing at this point? David himself is teaching us to pray. He, he's teaching us to, to pray with, with the confidence that, that God will do what he needs to do to take care of us. He, he prays with this confidence because he knows that the Lord himself will protect him from the enemy. Remember, David himself was a was a warrior, was an army man, was a, was a military guy. David himself, seeing that, or looking in his own situation, not even knowing if things will get better, he just cries out to the Lord. I want you to see one thing here. He, he, he shifts. And, and look at the text. It says, but you, O Lord, are shield about me, my glory, and my lifter of my head. David himself, he shifts his confidence away from the enemy to his confidence in the Lord. David responds now by not being emotional because you know how we get when we're emotional, right? Who am I preaching to in here? Preach, Pastor, preach. Come on, talk to me. Help me, help me. I help myself preach, Pastor, preach. <laughs> David doesn't respond with emotion. David responds theologically. He reminds himself who God is. He says God is a shield for him, about him. He's a shield protecting him. Now, we, we just went through the whole series on spiritual warfare. And this series on spiritual warfare, we talked about the shield of faith. Now, one of the things about the shield of faith is that in a military battle, what happens is that the shield is always one-sided, right? And when you're in the battle, you see the front side of the shield. But what David says, he says, God is a shield all about him. So in other words, God protects him on all sides. In the midst of every attack. Do you feel under attack right now? Do you feel under attack in certain areas of your life? Do you feel on attack mentally where you just feel like, you know, how you always say, Barry, you're crazy. Why are you crazy? Do you feel like sometimes in your mind it is about to explode and you don't know where to go, what to do, who to talk to, who gonna listen to you, and who you want to listen to? Trials become less trying when we place them in the glare of God's greatness. At this point, David is very low uh, in, in his life. This is the low point of his life. He, he confesses, Lord, you are a shield about me, my glory. That word glory is, is representative of, of God's glory being shown upon David. What David reflects back, God's glory. Notice all the mys in here. My glory. 
and the lifter of my hand. Mm -hmm. David was not to worry about what other people were thinking or what other people were saying about him. Mm -hmm. He's under this ultimate attack. And we have this sometime in our own lives when we feel like we failed. Have, have you been there? Have you felt like you failed in certain areas of your life? And do you feel like you, now that's past this, uh, do you feel like you're still failing in certain areas of your life? I don't hear a lot of talking now. <laughs> we, we, we feel like losers. We, we lash out. We, we laugh. We, we do all these things to circumvent the pain that we're really going through. And what David is doing here, David is saying that, okay, my focus and my pain, even though it's here, I'm going to focus on God. Verse 4, he said, I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy heel, mm -hmm. Selah. Mm -hmm. Charles Spurgeon writes this, he says, we need, not fear a, we need not fear a frowning world while we rejoice in a prayer hearing God. Mm -hmm. David gives us this wonderful answer to prayer. Now, what I want you to see and hear is about these words here. David said, I cried aloud to the Lord. Hey, have you ever cried aloud to the Lord? I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about this <laughs> liquid running out of everywhere. <laughs> You cry so much, you got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Snap field crying. Blood shot. Eyes crying. Crying where you can't even get the word out your mouth crying. You can't, you crying so hard to where you can't even articulate why you crying because you just hurt. Mm -hmm. Have you been there? Yes, yes, yes. Just crying. I, I woke up, I prayed, I woke up crying in my sleep. Because of some stuff that I saw. See, David said at this point in time, he says, I cried aloud to the Lord. There's a place and a time for this quiet, contemplative, meditative prayer. But there's a time in your life where everything falls loose and you gotta get on your knees, fall on your face, and pray, and cry, and snap, and say, God. One time, like, boy, you're giving me high blood pressure, you're gonna cause me to get a heart attack. <laughs> and that was just us being kids, you know, running around playing and stuff like that. But you have you ever been to that part in your life where you say, Enough's enough, and I'm ready to go? Come on. Good look. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. David said, I, I cried to the Lord, and I want to make sure you get that. Sometimes in our lives, the most effective way to get God's attention is not these popcorn, okay, Lord, would you bless me? Would you do this? It's to cry, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to save my marriage. I don't know how to save my finances. I don't know how to raise my kids. I don't know how to do any of this, Lord. Help me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, have you been there? Hey, have you been there? Yes. Yes. Preach, Pastor, preach. There comes a time when that pretty, cute prayer don't work no more. Mm. Look at your circumstances and look at the stuff that's around you. We are in a war. Mm. And the war is slightly for us to win, but if we don't walk in the wind, we ain't gonna win. And I'm talking about the wind of the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We have to get to this desperate place where our hearts are broken, mm. our minds are broken. We are confused and we don't even know what to say. When you get to that place, that's when God says, okay, you got enough, I'm coming to get you. Mm. Mm. And notice what David says again. What does he say? 
by saying, I lay down and slept. I woke up again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me, against me all around. Now, one of the things I want to realize, you know, because we're word by word, line by line, ministry, right? Well, Psalms 3 and 4 are considered an evening and a morning psalm. So, what we see here, they share the same theme. They share the same message and background because of Absalom and what's going on. Psalms 3 has been called the morning psalm, and Psalms 4 has been called the evening psalm. We, we get this from uh, Psalms chapter 4, verse 8, and it talks about how it kind of talks about the evening aspect of it. It says in Psalms 4, 8, it says this, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. So what, what, what's going on in these two verses here, we see something that happens in the morning and something that happens in the evening. The psalmist wants David himself, or David says, look, I lie down. And what we see here is that night after night, as David is going through these different things, he had faith in God to take care of him. Remember, God's all about him, all around him. He's a shield all around him. So what happens is that when he was going through those difficult times in life, he had God himself that sustained him. And when God sustained him, we see what David did. So sometimes you may have people looking at your own lives, or you may have to look at your own lives and say, okay, when things are going, going on, what you need to do is just go to sleep. You know, when kids are little, when they're just acting rebunctiously and they're jumping all over the place, what do we usually tell them? Go to bed, right? Why do we tell them to go to bed? <laughs> well, I don't know if leave us alone is theologically fit, but from a freshman standpoint, I know what you're saying. Look, just leave me alone go to bed, right? We tell them to go to sleep. Quickly. Because we know when the bad mood, nasty mood, cranky mood, or go to sleep. And you wake up, they wake up brand new. Hey, Daddy, how you doing? Uh, Wait, you would just cuss me out with your eyes. <laughs> and have, have your kids ever cuss you out with their eyes? Yeah. Well, look, don't you look at me like that. You know what you're saying, right? You better not be cussing me with your eyes. Don't let it slip out. I don't care how old you are. Don't let it slip out around me. I'll choke your throat. Sing to Jesus. <laughs> Right? Come on, I'll preach, Pastor Preach, right? We should go to sleep, right? Who am talking to right now? Who going through some stuff right now? Who's saying, look, I just want to sleep? I, I, I just want to sleep. See, what happens is that sometimes when we go through stuff, we, we wonder, where is God, right? When you go through stuff, you, you wonder, where, where, where is God at this? And I would beg to differ and tell you that God is still here because you are. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. That's the only way you're going to make it. The only way you're still here is because God is here. Because if God wasn't here, you would be out of here. You look at people's lives and it looks like everything all hunky dory and smiling and laughing and kicking kin and all that other good stuff and truly don't know what's going on behind the door. Yeah. And you say, Lord, look at my life. What is going on? Because I'm not feeling the same way they're looking. I want to look the same way they're feeling. Uh, or feel the same way they're looking. What did David do when he had all this trouble around? Let me ask, what has, God, what has God done for you? Let me tell you. When it gets rough on me, and anybody else, I'm going to give you these three words. This is how I know God is with me. I lay down. I slept. And I woke up again. 
Come on. I want to get that. When things are tough, what do you do? I lay down, I slept, and I woke up again. See, the problem is that when we can't sleep, is that we're worried about what's going on around us. I want to be like David. I lay down, I slept, and I woke up again. And I'm ready to go again. You keep track with me? This is what our lives should be displayed as. Total confidence in what God is doing for us and with us. In verse 6, he says, I will not be afraid of the many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. In other words, what he's saying is that there's 10,000 or thousands of people that are against him. And David is getting this from a context that his son has turned his kingdom against him. David said, you got all these different things turning against me, but I ain't scared. I ain't scared. <laughs> My cracking voice, I ain't scared. <laughs> See, what we must realize here is that God plus anything is the majority. Yes. In my life, I go through ups and downs, but I have to come to a place sometime before I act and react. God plus anything is the majority. And if I got the majority with me, you know what usually happens when you got the majority with you, right? You win, you win right? So, so when we got the majority with us, we naturally win. So God plus anything, we win. The odds are stacked in our favor. You realize we are held together and we are held together on this world by a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father called us. God the Son died for us. And God the Holy Spirit holds us until redemption is clear and perfect. Verses 7 and 8. Arise, O oh Lord, save me, O oh my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek, you break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord, your blessings be on your people, say la. Now, we see that Psalms 3 is an instructive prayer because David didn't ask for anything um, in this prayer until he gets to verse 7 and 8, right? You see this? Verses 1 to 2, he complains. He tells God, uh, God about his struggles, right? Mm -hmm. Verses 3 through 6, we've seen that David just affirms what God has done and what God has already did to make a difference in his life. A shield of protection around him. Now, in, in, in verse 7 and 8, we see David himself finally asking God to fight his battles. Do you ask God to fight your battles? I hope you're hearing. I hope you're hearing. I hope you're hearing. He is asking God to fight his battles. First, we see him saying, oh, save me. We, we get this from Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? We, we, we know about God saving his people. And one of the most interesting aspects of this psalm is verse 7, the second half. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. What is, what is David saying? What is, what is he saying at this moment in, in our own lives? And, and this is what I want to think I want you to realize. That it is interesting in this prayer it is that it's an impeccatory prayer. In other words, David himself is praying a curse over those folks who are messing with him. Ooh. 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 Now notice this. He says, strike my enemy on the cheek. When you strike somebody on the cheek, have you ever seen anybody got slapped? Yeah. <laughs> not yourself, not yourself. But have you ever seen anybody got slapped on TV? 
you know, in the heat of the moment, somebody just slap. And then, right after that dramatic pause, the screen work, the person looking like, <laughs> you know, right? Mm -hmm. David is saying, slap his enemies on the cheek. In other words, David is praying that God would embarrass his enemies. Those folks that are messing with me, God, I need you to slap on the cheek. In other words, I need you to embarrass them like they embarrassed me. Put them to shame like they put me to shame. It's in the Bible, it's not me. It sounds like it's me, but it's not me. Then he says, break the teeth of the wicked. Now, what David is describing at this particular point, he's describing his enemies as wild animals. And you know, if some don't have their teeth, what's going to happen? They can't eat, right? Especially a wild animal. In other words, what David is doing here, David is asking God to knock their teeth out. And why would he ask God to knock their teeth out or, or to break their teeth? He's asking God to do this so that they won't mess with him. In other words, he's asking God to slap them on the cheek, embarrass them, break their teeth so that when they do try to come against him, when they do gang around him or in, in a pack of a wild animal, wild wolves, when they get around their prey and they try to get their prey, all they're doing is gunk. <laughs> they're going to gunk somebody to death. In other words, they have no power. Right? And your enemy has no, no power over you. And this is what David's saying. Look, I need you to embarrass them, and I need you to slap them. I need you to... all oh, need dentures. So all I have to do is knock the dentures out. See, what we got to realize here is God doesn't have to move you to move your enemies. God can keep you safe right in the middle while you're going through it. And see, what happens is that we believe that we got to move. But what happens is that God himself don't have to move you to move your enemies. They won't hurt you, but God will make them gummy monsters. Uh, <laughs> I used to love when, uh, you know, my babies was little because one of the things, I knew they were teething because I would bite them on their cheek, but then they would turn around, could barely hold their head up, and they ah, 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 just try to gum on my, on my cheek. But then when I started growing my hair out, I used to love it when I grow my little beard out. I didn't have much back then, not like I got now. But I would grow down and have like these little prickly thorns, and they were, I was messing with them, and then they would try to bite back and they'd get the head off. Like they were just sucking on the fingers. You bite, they ain't doing nothing. God is on our side, and no one can hurt us. When we find ourselves in such a moment when we think that God is not there, God is truly delivering us because he's keeping us sane. The stuff that wants to drive us crazy, he is taking all the pain away. Thank you, Jesus. And I, I, I'll leave with this. This prayer here, as I said before, is an imprecatory prayer. In other words, it's a get him, Lord prayer. <laughs> Have you ever prayed to give the Lord a prayer? <laughs> Y'all need to start praying that way. <laughs> Folks messing, get them, Lord. Get them. It's a give them, Lord, prayer. In verse 8 Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Say life. Man's only hope for salvation is in doubt. Outside of God, there is no hope, no salvation. We're not saved by what we do for God, but we're saved by what God has done for us. Yes. One of my favorite verse, verses, Ephesians chapter 2, <laughs> verses 8 and 9. Ephesians, right? I had to go back. I couldn't just leave it. <laughs> verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. God is the one who saves physically, and God is the one who saves spiritually. I'll leave you with one more example from one of my favorite preachers. 
There was this young mother, and she just had a baby. And her dad was in the room, and she put the baby in the pen and said, you're not coming out this pen until you stop crying. So the baby was crying and howling and crying and howling and crying and howling. And, and the granddad, the daddy couldn't take it, the granddaddy couldn't take it anymore. So what did the granddaddy do? He went and took her out. And as he took her and rocked her in his arms and, 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 and consoled her, the baby stopped crying. But guess what? The mama walked back in the room. The mama walked back in the room and says, Daddy, this is my baby. And you're going to do what I say about my baby. Now, the dad is struggling because he wants to be obedient, but he wants to put the daughter in his place, in her place. But the daddy says, okay, this is your baby. You're right. You're right here. You're going to take the baby. Took the baby out the daddy's hands, put the baby back in the pen again. The baby just started crying, profusely crying, snotting at this time. The mom was gone, but the granddad is still there looking like, what is going on? What can I do? I want to obey my daughter, but I, I want to take care of my baby. So you know what the granddaddy did? He didn't cuss it out, because some of y'all would say, yeah, he cussed it out. He even got that baby. <laughs> the granddaddy went and got in the pen with the baby. Oh. He got in the pen with the baby, holding the baby, and look. He says, okay, she said you can't, you she said you can't come out, but she can't say I can't go in. So just like that, just like that, God himself, when you in your own trouble, when you in your own trial, when you going through your own hard time, is this, is that sometimes you feel like you're separated, but God is there with you. He is in it. He is with you, and he will get you through. Amen, amen, amen. I love y'all. Father, we thank you so much that you are good. And because you are good, you are worthy. And because you are worthy, you are worthy of our praise. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would help us be those people who know that you fight for us, you fight with us, Lord God, and you will protect us. Give us the strength this day, Lord God, to walk through our lives trouble. But make sure, Lord God, that we know that we can rely upon you and we can cry out to you knowing that you will hear us. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. Amen.